We often talk about a rights revolution as if there was a moment at which the Supreme Court started to protect individuals, but it was really a much more gradual development. And I would say that that development starts right around the time of World War I, and it starts with free speech cases. Now, remember that Barron versus Baltimore had said that only the federal government and not the states were governed by the Bill of Rights. So individuals only had rights against the federal government. The federal government didn't, in the 19th century it did sometimes, but in the, in the late 19th and early 20th century, the federal government didn't pass that many laws that violated individuals' free speech until World War I comes around. So in World War I, they uh, pass an Espionage Act and a Sedition Act, and suddenly the federal government is actively prosecuting socialists, communists, anarchists, Bolsheviks, all kinds of people with radical views. This is the moment of the Russian Revolution. It's World War I, and people are very worried about these crazy isms and these crazy ideologies, and the federal government is prosecuting a war during World War I, and there are a lot of people who are saying they're opposed to the draft, and people shouldn't go to the draft, and they're interfering with the war effort. So there are these prosecutions. So suddenly, these laws, these federal laws, are huge targets of litigation that people can say, you are violating my First Amendment rights to free speech. In addition, starting in 1917 and escalating in the 1920s, the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, becomes a major player. It starts out protecting conscientious objectors during the war, but after the war, when uh, there's something called the Red Scare and Palmer Raids and the federal government is really cracking down on alternative and conflicting ideologies, uh, communists especially, um, the ACLU becomes a much bigger player and starts to assert that the First Amendment does protect free speech and starts to bring cases against the federal government. And in the early, in the 1919, 1920, a few justices of the Supreme Court, particularly Justice Holmes and Brandeis, start to say, hey, I think there might be something to this, and they start to change their minds about free speech cases. And over the course of the 1920s, the Supreme Court becomes becomes much more sympathetic to free speech cases against the federal government, and then starts to say, well, huh, this seems weird that we would protect you against federal intrusions, but not state intrusions. And by the end of the 1920s, the court is regularly uh, striking down laws or invalidating convictions on the basis of um, uh, the First Amendment and saying that people have free speech rights against both the federal government and the state governments. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and the United States was suddenly at war with Japan, there was a lot of hysteria in the nation, both among citizens and among government officials, about uh, the possibility of espionage and sabotage from Japanese Americans in the United States. And this hysteria was in part based on stereotypes and longstanding animosity among, uh, among white Americans against Japanese Americans for a long time. Uh, one of the things that I think people don't realize when we talk about Japanese internment in World War II and their response to the Japanese is that there had not been uh, Japanese immigration to the United States for decades. It had been outlawed for decades. So all of the Japanese Americans, whether they were citizens or not citizens, if they were immigrants themselves or their children who were born citizens, um, they were all here for at least two decades. They were, they, they were not just off the boat. They had been here. Um, and not only that, they had been here, and a lot of people had been very prejudiced against them for a long time. So in California, where a lot of Japanese lived, um, a lot of Japanese Americans lived, uh, Japanese uh, Americans couldn't own land. They couldn't get fishing licenses. There were all of these disabilities on things that they could do. And a lot of the same people who uh, had been pushing for yet more anti-Japanese legislation in California and on the West Coast generally, saw the invasion uh, uh, in Pearl Harbor as an opportunity to really get rid of the Japanese-American problem once and for all, in their view, and, and get the Japanese off of the West Coast and, and move them inland. So um, there are executive orders. President Roosevelt issues executive orders that give the military enormous power uh, to... Um, um, 
create curfews for the Japanese, to round them up, to evacuate them, and eventually to put them in internment camps. Um, and eventually, what comes before the court are three separate cases. One case that asks the question whether the curfew orders are constitutional, and the court says yes, that's Hirabayashi. The next case that asks whether the evacuation orders are uh, constitutional, and that's Korematsu v. United States. And again, the court says that that's constitutional. And then there's a final case um, uh, where the court is asked whether the internment camps are constitutional. And they eventually say no, although not until the internment camps are already closed. Uh, they, they, in fact, wait to decide the, the, the opinion until the camps are actually closed. Um, but Korematsu becomes the most famous of these cases. And even though it's about evacuation, not internment, it comes to stand for the idea that we allowed this to happen. And not only we, but the court allowed this to happen. Um, and what's really interesting is the way that Korematsu actually comes to stand for something quite the opposite of what it stood for at the time. So at the time, the court upholds the uh, the evacuation orders. It's a split decision. There are dissenters who are very upset about this. The majority of the court says, who are we to say what our military policy should be? We can't do this. If the military says this is military necessity, we have to agree, right? We don't have all the facts. They have all the facts. It's not our job. We can't do this. Uh, and the dissenters say, this isn't military necessity. This is racism. <laughs> you shouldn't do this. And uh, Justice Robert Jackson has a really interesting dissent where he says, it's not just that the military are, are going to do this, whatever we say. Maybe they will. Maybe even if we say no, they're going to do what they want to do. But we can't give this the sanction of the Constitution. We're worse than they are if we say it's constitutional. And that means next time people are going to say it's constitutional and they can do it again. And so Jackson is worried that this is going to look like the court just rubber stamping oppression and discrimination and horrible things. Uh, and, and that's actually what people think of Korematsu to a large extent as a political matter, right? The way the judiciary interacts with the other branches. This is a moment where the judiciary really gulped and didn't say, we're non-political for a reason. There's a reason we're appointed for life. We're not supposed to be swayed by the winds of politics. We're not supposed to be hysterical when everyone else is hysterical. We're supposed to be the voice of reason that says the Constitution endures and the Constitution protects individuals and these are individuals who need protection. And that's not what the court did. On the other hand, in writing this opinion, what the majority of justices say is that any time a law discriminates against people on the basis of race, it has to be looked at really carefully. And this comes to be known as strict scrutiny. And the court says, we have to look really closely whenever a government says we're treating some people different from other people because of their race. They look really hard and they blink, right? And they still allow the government to do it. But what's really interesting is that Korematsu as a case becomes the precedent going forward eventually, that says, huh, when governments regulate race, when governments harm people because of their race, we need to look really carefully. And it might justify our ability to step in as courts and protect people who are being discriminated against on the basis of their race.